Uh, today's reading is coming from Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 16, until chapter 6, verse 1. It reads as follows. I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I am warning you about these things as I have warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so that you won't also be tempted. This is the word of God. We are currently in a series called I Am Who I Am. In the series we are studying God, His character, His name and how He reveals Himself through the scriptures. We say that we want this series to be encouraging to you, we want it to inspire all in your life, we want you to feel strengthened and we want you to learn and to discover who this God is that we worship together as a church. We looked at God's name, we journeyed through the Old Testament, then we looked at Jesus as God becoming a human being, still carrying the same name, still doing the same things, still working for salvation and forgiveness of sins and restoring back uh, this broken world to what He initially created it to be. And then from last week onwards, we move into the latter part of the Scriptures where we find the Holy Spirit and we say, now we will talk about the Holy Spirit. I said to you last week that we're going to spend six weeks just talking about God as Holy Spirit. And we are going to see if we can build a coherent, holistic, biblical picture of who the Holy Spirit is and how He works. I asked the question last week, if someone stops you now and says, tell me about the Holy Spirit, what would you say to them? Now, I'm not trying to trick you or to get you to answer wrongly. I just want you to think about how broad that question is and how many things there are actually that we can say about the Spirit. So last week we spoke about the Spirit as life giver. The Spirit is the one that gives life. The Spirit takes chaos and wild and waste and creates perfection and order and beauty. The Spirit was present in the beginning of creation the Spirit was present when our Saviour was conceived in His mother's womb. The Spirit is present in our lives and gives us life. So that's the first important thing you should connect to the work of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is a life giver. And this week we are going to take off where we left off last week. And we are going to talk about the Spirit and the fruit. Now I said to you last week. The reason why I think this part of the series is important and the reason why this message is important is blatantly just because it will change your life. It will revitalize your spiritual life if you understand the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. It will bring back a vitality and a refreshment and a feeling of life everlasting, a feeling of overflow, a feeling of abundance. And I don't know how many of you would say no to that this morning. Right? Do you want to feel alive? Do you want to feel revitalized? Do you want to feel like your cup overflows? No, thank you. I'm pretty good in this current state that I'm in. Not a lot of people will say that. So that's why it's important for us to focus in this part of the series. Let me ask you a question. What is the Holy Spirit currently forming in you? What is the Holy Spirit currently forming in you? I was texting with one of our brothers this week and he sent this back to me. Quote, I think God's doing work in me regarding surrender and patience. 
End quote. So praise God for the fact that he's working in my brother. And also praise God for the fact that my brother is aware of how God is working in his life. Like I love texts like that. Because God is working in each and every one of us. Let me ask you the question again. What is the Holy Spirit currently forming inside of you? If you are a non-believer, and you don't believe in Jesus Christ, let me ask you this question. What are you currently struggling with? And what kind of change are you longing for? Because if you don't believe in Jesus, you still want to change. And you're still struggling with stuff. And you still long for a better life. This is an important question. Listen to what N.T. Wright says about the spirit inside of us. He says, those in whom the spirit comes to live are God's new temple. We know this from Paul's teaching. They are individually and corporately places where heaven and earth meet. Come on. I, Rainer Mayer, you, Yvonne, and everyone else of you. If you are a believer and the Spirit dwells inside of you, you are a place where heaven and earth meets. We are a place corporately where heaven and earth meet because the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. Let's pretend for a second. That this is you. You've just opened up a piece of land. You've ploughed it. You've cleaned it out. And now you're going to start farming. If farming feels too big to you, let's talk about gardening. But this is where you are at. I open up a piece of field because I want to start growing stuff here. So obviously it started with a cleaning out process. So cleaning out the ground, getting it ready. Now, you're going to need seed, obviously. You're going to have to decide, what do I want to grow here? And then you're going to have to get the seeds, and you're going to have to put it in the ground, also with a specific method. Do you only need soil and seeds to farm? No, you need more. You need the elements. You need rain, you need water, you need nutrients in the soil, and most of all, you need the sun. If you don't have the sun, there's absolutely no growth, no energy, and no farming. Will this piece of land be well farmed if you stop there after putting the seed in the ground and giving it the elements? Absolutely not. What you need to do then is you're going to have to protect it from outside influences. Because there will be stuff coming from the ground that you need to weed out. There will be stuff coming on the ground, chowing and grazing what you're busy growing and destroying it. And there will be stuff coming from the air, chowing what you're trying to grow. So it's not only about cleaning up the land, putting in the seed and letting the elements do its work. It's about tending. It's about cultivating. And it's about protecting the good from what is bad. And making sure that if you get hit by something bad, that you take them out. Quick story. A couple of houses ago, what I mean with a couple of houses, two houses ago for my wife and I, we've moved four times in ten years. We had a vegetable garden when we moved in with some really, really beautiful tomatoes. And one day we came out of our back door and the tomatoes were absolutely slaughtered, like destroyed, decimated. And both my wife and I went, what on earth could pull such a big act of revenge on our tomatoes? We tried to see and, you know, we spied a little bit on the tomatoes through the course of the day, but we never actually found what it was that destroyed our tomatoes. And then one day I was in front of the house in the kitchen, and I heard a sound that sounded like this. And living in South Africa, I immediately went, ah, someone is breaking into our house. This is going to be a phenomenal experience. I think someone is breaking the window in the study. And the study had a window that looked to the vegetable garden. And I went down the corridor. Dun, 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 dun. I don't actually have a gun, I'm just pretending to have a gun. And when I came around the corner, it was a woodpecker. Pecking at himself in our window, right? Seeing another woodpecker as a reflection and going, look at it, look at it, how's it, how's it, how's it? Going at our window. And then I saw another woodpecker on the tomatoes going. Like you just saw all those seeds and the flesh of the tomatoes splash everywhere. And then we knew we had to take the woodpeckers out. So someone told us, take a CD. You guys remember CDs back in the day? Anyway, take a CD, flip it over, and then the sun will reflect the, uh, uh, the sun will reflect its light through the CD, 
and the woodpeckers will stay away. And we did it. Why? Because it was an influence that was going to ruin our hearts. So you have to work it, you have to cultivate it, you have to take care. This is your life if you are a believer of Christ. And this is what the Spirit does. This is how spiritual growth and bearing fruit works. So when you come to faith, you clean up your life. Right? You plow the soil. You pull out all the weeds. But that's not when it stops. It's a lifelong journey of work and cultivation and growth. And it works in the same way. You have to put seed in the ground and you have to work and cultivate the ground. But you also have to take advice from an expert telling you how to do this. You have to have someone that can give you life hacks on how to take out the bad stuff and put in the good stuff. And you also need way more than only your seeds and cultivation skills. You need something as powerful as the sun to actually bring the true growth. So that you can end up here, Riddles, if you can just show us this marvelous collection of veg and fruit. This is what Paul is talking about in this teaching text. He says, the Spirit grows this inside of you. And the way that the Spirit grows this inside of you, you can just go back to the previous slide, please, is by this uh, sequence of events. So it's both the sunshine and the fall of farm. It's both putting in the good stuff and keeping out the bad stuff. It's both working at yourself and listening to advice of the best practice on how to get this crop to yield what you want it to yield. Now think about this. If I'm on my way to farm, whose work is primary? My work as a farmer? Or the sun as the sun. It has to be the sun. Like I'll get no. I'll plow and plant and water. But without the sun I'll get no. And in the same way the Holy Spirit works inside of us. To grow fruit. So we also work with Him. We tend to the garden. We cultivate. We point to the good stuff. We keep out the bad stuff. We make sure we listen to His advice and His healing. But as sure as you can't farm without the sun. I'm telling you now, you will not grow fruit without the Spirit. Do you guys see the metaphor? Okay. Here's what we're going to do today. Three points. Where are we now? Verses 16 to 18. What should we not do? Verses 19 to 21. And what should we do? Verses 22 to 6, verse 1. I know if you've been a Christian for a while, you have read this text, you've heard many sermons on it. I just want to add another sermon to it. Right? I won't be able to say everything there is to say about this text. Before we dive into it, let me pray. Holy Spirit, we believe that you are in us and around us at this moment. We believe that you want to grow fruit. And we believe, as the teaching text said, that we should walk in step with you. So I pray as we open up the scriptures now and we look at the reality of what we're facing and we feel the conviction of all the bad stuff in our lives and we see the compelling nature of all the good stuff that can grow in our lives. I pray that you transform us and that you transform us deeply. I pray that in your name. Amen. Okay, where are we now? Verses 16 to 18. Rudolf, if you could just put that on for us. So the bold and underlines, that's my emphasis. You'll see the Spirit and you'll see the flesh and then you'll see the word opposed and then you'll see the statement if you are led by the Spirit. That's where we are now, guys, as human beings proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, having His Spirit dwelling inside of us, living in a broken and sinful world while seeing the kingdom of Jesus come until He comes back and stores everything. This is where we are. One thing opposed to something else, coexisting at the same time, fighting with one another. Back to the farming metaphor. You've got some really good fertile soil. In that soil, there will be weeds at the same time. Millies and weeds. Fighting against one another. Because the millies want the nutrients and the weeds want the nutrients. The millies want the elements and the weeds want the elements. 
They are opposed to one another. And we need to make a choice. And the choice we need to make is who are we led by? It's really simple. Because we can't uh, deny the one. We also can't live perfectly in the other. There's this constant fight of these two forces. Paul says, you are led by the Spirit. You should walk by the Spirit. And when you do that, you should not carry out the desires of the flesh. Because the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, but the Spirit desires against the flesh. There's this fight going on. And I think we just need to pause there for a second and deal with this reality. This is where we are. None of us can be perfect. None of us can be exempt from sin. None of us can be exempt from the temptation of the evil one. None of us can be exempt from the works of the flesh. All of us have to choose which one is it that we are aligning with. And that's why Paul says, so seeing that this fight's going on, let me paint a picture for you. This is what you should not do, the works of the flesh. And this is what you should do, the work of the Spirit. Remembering that the Spirit, just like the son and the professional farmer giving you advice, helps you in this journey of growth. Okay. So that's the first one done. That's verse 16 to 18. It's a statement. And it's really clear to us. Now what should we not do? Let's look at verses 19 to 21. Before we read them, Rudolf, if I could just see the slide that has the sun because there's quite a lot in them. Verses 19 to 21 maps out 15 facets of our broken human condition. Think about the farming metaphor again. What should I look out for that will be in my field that I need to take out immediately? This is what Paul says. Look here first. If you want to know if there's something present in your life that will stifle the growth of the fruit of the Spirit, start here. And then he maps out 15 things. He maps out three ways in which our sexual brokenness hinders us from growing the fruit of the Spirit. He maps out two ways in which our relationship to the spiritual realm stifles growth and will cause us not to bear fruit. Eight ways in which our relationships to each other stifles growth. And two ways in which our relationship to ourselves starts with. Okay? So there's a little summary for you of what we should not do. So if we can go back to the teaching text, please. So let's just walk through this really, really slow. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, and promiscuity together are umbrella terms to describe everything that has to do with sexual relations with any other human being outside of the bonds of marriage. Okay? So one man, one woman, entering into a lifelong covenantal relationship with one another, enjoying physical intimacy that comes with that institution, that is a tick. That's right. Those three words cover everything else you could possibly think of that doesn't fit into that picture. And here's what I want you to see. Paul says, that's bad stuff. Your fields won't grow. Or your fields won't yield. You need to take them out. You need to fight against them. You need a life hack to deal with them. Otherwise, they're going to be grow. Why? Well, guys, because everything that has to do with sexual intimacy has to do with our whole being. The problem with sex in the world we live in today is we have a low view of it. We think it's just something you do to have some fun. We throw it over the bow of natural instincts that God, that God has endowed us with. But in the act of sex or sexual intimacy, your whole being is involved. In no other act, your body, mind and soul together as a unit is entwined and uh, involved in such a significant way. I mean, like, I love chowing a burger, let's be honest. And I'm really involved when I chow a burger. Do you know what I mean? Like, get a good grip, slam it in your face, get a good first bite, have the sauce all over the chin and all over the fingers. It's a full body experience. 
But it's still not, it still doesn't involve my whole being in the same way as sexual intimacy with my wife does. And your whole being is important. Your whole being is the field in which the fruit should grow. So if you mess with your whole being, you are going to mess with your field. That's why Paul starts with that list. For us as Westerners, it feels weird to think, Whoa, dude, like, why did you go to sex first? Because your whole being is involved in it. And the Spirit wants to transform and grow in your whole being. So this counts for everything. And not even stuff that we are currently involved in, but stuff that we were involved in. That's the problem with the world we live in. Is all of us have a sexuality that is broken by the world we live in. Because the world teaches us and conditions us to live out ourselves sexually in a way that is not biblical. And then it breaks it down. So, we enter into sexual relations with a broken sexuality. And that's why the Spirit needs to redeem it and build it back up. But that's one way in which you will not see the spirit grow fruit in your life. That's why we, as a church, and as men, as leaders, and as your elders, have such a massive fight against pornography at the moment. Because it's ruined when we tell people. Both men and women. Period. I don't care how much you think you've got it under control. Or it's only every now and then. Paul says you will not yield fruit. The spirit and the sun cannot let this grow because it's full of weeds. So there's three ways that Paul maps out. Two things that he shows. Oh, I'm going way too long. I'll get going now. Look at the idolatry and sorcery. That is a way of having a relationship with the spiritual realm. Trusting them to do to you what you want to be done. Paul says it doesn't work that way. Like you don't serve God for the stuff you get. You serve God because He loves you and He wants to be in a relationship with you. And He's made a way for you to be in a relationship with Him. And then out of thankfulness and humility, you respond to Him. Why do my kids love me? Because I stand like this with open arms and ready to receive them. They just can't say no to the invitation. Like my kids don't love me because we've got smarties in the cupboard. My kids don't love me because we've got fiber and they can watch YouTube kids. My kids love me because I'm their dad. It's just how it is. And it's the same with why we serve God. And sorcery was a practice back in the day when Paul wrote this letter to invoke something so that you can get a specific result. Our world is full of sorcery. Just look at the lab posts. Some or another doctor or a healer that will give you exactly what you want. And they can manipulate lots of results and they can bring back your lost lover, etc., etc. That's all idolatry and sorcery. That's not the way that the Spirit can grow fruit in your life if you relate to God in this way. He's not a magician. He's the creator and the sustainer of everything wanting to be in relationship with you. Then Paul maps out eight rippers when it comes to our relationships with one another. And what he says, I want you to hear this, if you see this in your life, get it out. Weed it out. Put some, what's gif in English? Poison. Put some poison on it. Like, deal with it. Because it's going to kill your crop. Hate it. Strive. Jealousy. Bursts of anger. Selfish ambitions. Dissensions. Factions. Envy. Think about your life. If these things are present in your life, Get it out. Because the Spirit wants to bring fruit. And the Spirit will not bring fruit if those are present. All of us are guilty of them. I'm not saying that I'm hating them. But the point is, guys, if I have a random burst of anger, I need to know that this can't stay. If I feel jealous about people, I need to repent from it. If I'm busy stirring up factions and Gossiping about people, I need to stop. Because it's going to grow and grow and grow and it's going to kill everything that the Spirit wants to do inside of me. I'm not cultivating the land. I'm leaving the land. And I'm irresponsible with the land. Drunkenness and carousing back in Paul's day was stuff people did when they got together. Right? So it was part of their temple worship. So that would be like us now today, drinking and just having a whole lot of sex with one another. 
That's what they did back in the day as part of their temple worship. Paul says that has to do with your relationship with yourself. If you submit yourself under something that then gains control of you, you're done. You won't have spirit, or you won't have fruit of the spirit in your life. Think about it. That's the big issue with drunkenness. Is I am relinquishing control, make a note because we'll get to self-control later. I'm relinquishing control of my life to chemicals in my brain. And then I'm acting accordingly. That's not a lot of respect for yourself. Because how can you just relinquish control of your own body? And carousing is the same. And then just to make sure that none of us can claim that we are awesome, Paul adds this beauty, and anything similar. Okay. So if you struggle with something and it's not on the list, don't go, boom, shakalaka, I'm not on the list. You are. Because it's anything similar. And in exactly the same way that I am your pastor this morning and warning you against these things, Paul says the same. I'm warning you. People who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Because why? Because they don't want to. Like someone who lives that way and are not led by the Spirit, why on earth would they want to inherit the kingdom of God anyway? It's actually a really plain statement that Paul is making. Okay, so where are we now? Things are, we have a struggle between the flesh and the Spirit. We are led by the Spirit. So what should we not do? We should weed these things out. Hardcore. Cultivate them and take them to them. What should we do? Let's have a on the next slide. Uh, and another slide, please, Rudolf. So, what I want you to see is that we're talking about fruit singular. It's not nine types of fruits. It's not like apples, bananas, grapes, raspberries, mangoes, and papaya. It's one thing, but it's ninefold. Why? Because they can't exclude one another. I mean, how can you love someone but you don't have patience? How can you be kind to someone but you don't love someone? You know what I mean? Like, how can you have self-control but you can't be patient? It's one thing that is being cultivated and formed in your life by the Spirit. But it's got these nine beautiful faces and angles and dimensions. And I sort of them in one, two, three, one, one, and one. Because I think it's worth talking about them. In those little categories. Okay, so let's look at what we should do. If we weed out the things we should not do, and we protect our field from these outside influences, and we are um, really intentional about this fight between flesh and spirit, and we are led by the spirit, here's what the spirit will do in our lives. We'll see about it. And this isn't a warm, fuzzy feeling kind of thing. This is a love that says, I will do something for you that costs me so that you can be loved. A self-sacrificial love. A other-minded love. It will grow in life. Think about joy and peace. So two beautiful things in this world we live in. But who wouldn't want that? The Spirit is busy forming that inside of us. Joy in the midst of hardships. Peace in a time of unrest. That's what the Spirit does for us. Think about the virtues of patience, kindness, and goodness in our human relationships. These are the exact opposite than the eight Paul just listed that will kill your relationships. It's the exact opposite. Because in patience, a relationship can grow. With kindness and goodness shown towards one another. We become closer to one another. We feel love. We are transformed into the Spirit, uh, uh, into the image of Christ by the Spirit. Think about faithfulness. My yes is my yes and my no is my no. And I will do what I said I will do. That's what the Spirit wants to create inside of you. That is a beautiful fruit that emerges from the soil of your life. If you cultivate it and you tend to it and you let the sun shine and you let the water flow. Think about gentleness. We live in a world with hot heads and cold hearts. We live in a world that people lash out at each other really, really quickly. South Africa is one of the worst countries in the world when it comes to road rage. Okay? Blowing horns and showing hand signs. And we all know that road rage is not about the person in front of you. It's about whatever else is going on in your heart, right? Because the person in front of you makes an honest mistake and then you lose it completely. 
Christians through the spirit are changeable. And then more than that, we can control ourselves. That is what the spirit wants to shape inside of us. So the big philosophers of Paul's day, of Paul's day said that if you really, really, really want to um, uh, actualize yourself, you need to learn how to control other people. Right? You need to be able to manipulate other people through dialogue, through cleverness. Paul says, no, no, forget about other people. Just control yourself. And do you guys realize that a person that controls themselves or a person that is probably as close to fully human as they can be? Because they know themselves. They know their shortcomings. They are consistent. They are not easily angered or provoked. Because they can control themselves. And even if they are, Angered or provoked, they have control of themselves. So, how do we do this? If you just go back to the teaching text, please, it's all right here. I don't even have to think of a clever way to apply this. Look at verse 24. You who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh. This is how we do it crucify it, sign the death certificate, and let it die. What's important about this method of execution? You might not know it, but sometimes in the New Testament world, when the Roman government crucified people, they crucified them, right? Nailed them to a tree, signed the death certificate, and leave the people to die. Like they haven't died yet, but they will definitely die because of the way that they're being executed at the moment. So, as good as they sign the death certificate and just wait for the death to happen. That's exactly what Paul says is happening to us. We have crucified the flesh. It's as good as dead. The death certificate is signed. It might still huff and puff with some life on the tree, but it will die eventually. That's what we did with it. It does not dictate what we do. With its passions and desires. We live by the Spirit, and we should keep in step with the Spirit. Guys, this means, as we look over the land of our life, and we think about the cultivation and the farming and the discipline that needs to happen. That means, keeping in step with the Spirit, that we would feel a burst of anger. And then see that this is an opportunity for patience to grow. We will participate in a conversation that creates factions. And we will see that this is an opportunity for kindness to emerge. And that is how we cultivate the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Is keeping in step with these kind of convictions. Do you guys see that? So it's taking out the bad stuff, but then also giving the good stuff what is needed. And this is a really personal and beautiful dynamic process in the life of every single believer. Is I decided to farm, I cleared out the land, I called in the Holy Spirit as my personal pro farmer. And he's shining this, the sun on the, uh, on the fields of my life. Like I stand by him. I'm marked by him. I'm his. This is my life. So that commitment's there. And that truth is there. Now it's about getting the good takers out. And it's about pulling the weeds out. And it's remembering what we should not do and what we should do. And seeing how weeding something out gives opportunity for something new to grow. That's why I asked you the question in the beginning of this sermon. What is God currently forming inside of you? Because if we are not aware of what God is busy with us, then our fields will become untended and uncultivated. And our lives will become shambles. And we will feel really, really either guilty or convicted about the fact that we are not yielding fruit. The fruit that the Spirit wants to do in our lives. I'll create an opportunity just at the end of the service for us to reflect on this again. Last thing that I want you to see is in 6 verse 1. So chapter divisions was obviously added to later. This later. I think 6 verse 1 still has to do with this whole vibe of living by the Spirit. And look what it says. If someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, you who are led by the Spirit, restore such a person with a gentle spirit. Guys, can you imagine if I would see weeds in your life and I gently offer to restore you and help you? Can you imagine how great it would be if we could have a church that has that culture in which you can see weeds in my life 
and say to them, dude, I see some wounds there. We need to pull that out. Let me help you and let me restore you. For some reason, the church, I'm talking in a generalization now, has become a place where if your life is full of weeds and woodpeckers, you just never come back. And Paul says, no, that shouldn't happen. Having a life full of weeds and woodpeckers should be a reason for you to leave. Because there are people around you, brothers and sisters, that will restore you. And please, you are led by the Spirit. Do it in a gentle and loving spirit. No condemnation for those who are in Christ. No judgment from us. That's not our job. That's God's job. Let me restore you. Can you guys imagine the fruit the Spirit will form inside of us if we have this culture of restoration and gentleness? And if we really, really, really are intentional with what the Spirit is growing inside of us at this moment. Now you might feel it's unattainable, but I know, great sermon, compelling argument, I can't do it dude. like I'm done. I've tried so many times and I've just can't it. The only thing that I want to point you to is this. And not necessarily the Bible, which is a book with letters and pages, but the story of Jesus who did it in a perfect way. Because he's the only human being that could have ever lived a life that only yielded fruit and that had no weeds and good things. But because he lived that life, he could pay the price for us. And because he could pay the price for us, we can be reconciled to God. And because we can be reconciled to God, he chose to put his spirit inside of us. And now we can also be fruit. So don't be discouraged. Don't feel like the bar is too high. Don't feel like you want to give up. Don't feel like your field has been overtaken by uh, weeds and woodpeckers. Know that the one who could have lived this perfectly made a way for us so that we can experience this freedom, that we can experience this revitalization, and that we can bear fruit. Rudolf, we need to go back to the photo of the fruit, please, in the veg. I mean, it's not all the fruit and veg you can get in the world, but it is really beautiful. And if we just stare at this long enough, we might reach out to grab some. We might want this if we look at this long enough. That's why it's so important for us as Christians to also bear fruit, because it's part of our witness to the world. People should look at your life and go, I want some. I want some. It's very really beautiful. People should look at the life of our church, a new church in this area, and go, I want some. I want some of that. It looks really compelling. That's the work of the Spirit inside of us. It's a beautiful journey. It's a great adventure. The Spirit is a life giver. Last week, the Spirit brings forth fruit. This week. Two big building blocks of the person and the work of the Spirit. Amen.